Good afternoon and welcome to the fiscal year 2019 Federal State Partnership for, Good, for State of Good Repair Grant Program webinar. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to go over the webinar format for today. We will start off with a brief introduction, ask a few poll questions, and then launch into the presentation. Our speakers will take turns discussing the material, and we will have a few poll questions throughout to get some information from you. Following that, we will have a question and answer session where the FRA will answer your questions posted in the questions for presenters pod. Today's speakers are all staff at FRA and include Brian Rada, Amy Hauser, and Nate Vomasil. I will now turn it over to Brian. Thank you, Mary. Welcome, everyone, for joining us on the webinar today. Um, I want to give first the overview of the agenda for today. I'll be starting off with giving an overview of the Federal-State Partnership for State Good Repair Program. I'll hand off to my colleague, Amy Hauser, to go through how to apply. And then the team will handle the various parts of the best practices and guidance for submitting your applications. Finally, at the end, we hope to have a, a good amount of time to answer any questions that you may have during uh, the webinar. Now, I actually hand it back over to Mary as we're going to start with a couple polling questions. Thank you, Brian. Our first polling question is, what type of organization do you represent? A, state, including DC, B, interstate compact, C, public agency or publicly chartered authority, D, local government, E, Amtrak, F, industry or consultant, G, other. And we'll give this just a few seconds to allow people to answer. Thank you all. It looks like the majority of folks today on the call are from the state, about 27%. 13% uh, are from a public agency or publicly chartered authority. And 35% come from the industry or consultant. The second polling question that we have is, did you participate in any previous discretionary grant program webinars? A, yes, I've participated in a live webinar. B, yes, I've watched a recorded webinar online. Or C, no, I have not previously attended or watched any webinars. And we'll just give that a few seconds more. All right, thank you all so much for participating. It looks like we have 60% um, who have participated in a live webinar, about 9% have watched a recorded webinar, and about 30% have not previously attended or watched. All right, Brian, back to you. All right, thank you, Mary. Um, glad to have you all along today. So I'm going to give you an overview of the Federal State Partnership Program requirements. I'm going to cover the program purpose, the eligible application, applicants, eligible projects, and other important considerations that you should all be thinking of as you, as you consider whether to submit applications. So I'll begin with the program purpose. And the purpose here, the Federal State Partnership for State Repair Program, is to fund capital projects in the U.S. that repair, replace, or rehabilitate certain qualified railroad assets to reduce the state of good repair backlog and improve inner city passenger rail performance. And I'll talk more in a minute about capital projects and also qualified railroad assets and how those terms are defined as they're important to the function of the program. I'll note also, if you're familiar with FRA's Consolidated Railroad Infrastructure and Safety Improvements Program, or the CRISI program, you may notice a key difference in the partnership program is the focus on capital projects. We don't have eligibility for planning and PE, uh, preliminary engineering, or environmental clearance work through the partnership program. Another important distinction is the partnership program is for projects on Amtrak or publicly owned or controlled railroad assets. This is part of the program's definition of qualified railroad assets that I'll discuss more later. So here in this program, we're focused on a particular subset of all the U.S. railroad assets. The current Notice of Funding Opportunity, or NOFO, was published on October 8, 2019, 
We made $396 million available from Congressional Fiscal Year 2019 appropriations, and applications are due by 5 p.m. Eastern Time on December 9th. The program does allow for concurrent applications, so if you have a project that would be eligible for the partnership program and is also eligible or you've already previously submitted it to other programs at uh, U.S. Department of Transportation, you can resubmit that ap application here. Just be sure to identify for us the other programs where that's been submitted. Then I'll discuss some key definitions in the partnership program. First, capital project. Um, it's important you have a capital project. And as you see from the definition here, a fundamental element is that partnership program projects must benefit inner city passenger rail transportation. Projects may also benefit other transportation modes, commuter freight rail, local transit, et cetera, but they must benefit inner city passenger rail to be eligible for the partnership program. And to be competitive for selections, the project must be justified as a reasonable investment in inner city passenger rail even if those other modes are benefiting from the project. Also mention that um, we've defined a major capital project in this program as any project where the proposed total project cost is $300 million or more. The second definition I'm going to walk through is the definition of state of good repair. And in the partnership program, there are these three conditions identified that define whether a uh, railroad asset is in a state of repair. And the definition here is the definition that provides the condition when assets are considered in a state of repair. So to be in a state of repair is when your condition of the physical assets are performing at the level that they were, that's at least equal to what they were built as or designed to be. The life cycle cost of maintaining those assets is lower than the cost of replacing them, and assets are being sustained through regular maintenance and replacement programs. So in the context of this program, we're actually looking for assets that cannot meet this full definition because we're looking for assets not in the state of repair um, to be improved. The third definition I want to make you aware of is that there's a geographical element that's important in the partnership program. And that's because some eligibility requirements differ whether you're, uh, you have a project on the Northeast Corridor or elsewhere around the U.S. And for this program, the Northeast Corridor is explicitly defined as the main rail line spine stretching from Boston, Massachusetts to Washington, D.C., plus a few small branch lines, one from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Philadelphia, another from Springfield, Massachusetts through Hartford to New Haven, Connecticut, and a third uh, extension from Spite and Dival, New York, New York to New York Penn Station. Now let's talk about eligibility. There are two parts to eligibility, applicant eligibility and project eligibility. Your application needs to demonstrate that you satisfy both applicant and project eligibility. So here's the list of eligible applicants. Most of these are self-explanatory. Um, I will note that public agencies, public chartered authorities, you can generally think there of transit agencies or other special purpose um, transportation agencies that might be established by one or more states. In political subdivisions of states is essentially just a fancy way to um, cover city or municipal government, county government, and other you know, subdivisions, smaller governmental units than, than a full state. There's a selection preference in the partnership program for joint applications. To be a joint application, it needs to be submitted by multiple eligible applicants, so multiple entities of the set of folks on the list above. And that's Part of why and the last bullet of the eligible applicants includes any combination of the eligible entities. Also, entities that are not themselves directly eligible, which could include a private company, uh, maybe a nonprofit organization, um, a freight railroad or something uh, of that nature, they may be included and named in an application as a project partner. They could also have a formal role in the application Maybe they're providing a non-federal match funding, maybe a letter of support, or taking on some other role. Um, you're encouraged to include them as appropriate in your applications. However, those entities, if they're not in that eligible applicant list, uh, those entities will not be able to count toward the selection preference criteria.
Here are the guidelines for submitting a joint application. First, you must identify a lead applicant who will serve as the application point of contact and the presumptive grant recipient if selected for an award. Your application should include all joint applicants. Each joint applicant needs to sign on to the application independently with a signature from an authorized representative of that organization. You can include a consolidated signing sheet that all application parties sign on to or a separate letter from each joint applicant. The statement should affirm that the entity is a joint applicant, not just a generic letter of support. Finally, describe the anticipated roles and responsibilities between the set of applicants. These roles are at your discretion and should make sense in the context of the proposed project. FRA requests this so we have an understanding of how the project would likely be implemented and so you demonstrate that as a set of applicants you've thought about project implementation issues in advance. Another eligibility requirement is providing appropriate non-federal matching funds. The match requirements here by statute is that the federal share cannot exceed 80% of project funds, which means that conversely, there must be at least a 20% non-federal match. There is a call out specific to whether Amtrak is an applicant, and if Amtrak is an applicant, Amtrak may use its ticket or other revenues as match funds. Amtrak should indicate what sources are being used for that purpose. There are two selection preferences related to matching funds. The first is for providing 50% or greater non-federal match, and the other is for match funds provided by multiple sources um, and from multiple stakeholders that demonstrate broad participation. This could mean a state, Amtrak, city government, and private firm all making contributions to a project or some similar combination. Consistent with the match preferences, in the first round of Fed State Partnership Program selections, the overall average selected project had a 39% non-federal match, which is double the statutory minimum. This generally shows the importance of providing matching funds to allow FRA to leverage federal funds to the greatest extent possible and will make your application more competitive in selection. Now let's discuss project eligibility. Here's the overview. As mentioned earlier, you need a capital project, so planning, P, NEPA, activities are not eligible. That's preliminary engineering or National Environmental Policy Act, so environmental reviews are not eligible. Final design is eligible if, include, if included and in conjunction with an award that includes part or all of a project construction. I'll discuss the qualified railroad asset definition in more detail in the next couple slides. So in the third part is to make sure you're carrying out the right types of activities. And this generally includes any replacement, repair, rehabilitation of assets, either in kind or with assets that increase capacity and provide a higher level of service. It also could include projects that allow service to be maintained while existing assets are brought into a state of good repair and just generally bringing any assets into a state of repair. And FRA anticipates that most partnership program projects would carry out several of these, and that's fine. Um, very much what we would expect uh, to see in this program. So let's talk about qualified, the Qualified Railroad Asset definition in more detail. Um, this, the, the meeting the Qualified Railroad Asset de definition is part of being an eligible project. The definition has three parts, and the first, sorry, the first is that uh, um, assets need to be owned or controlled by the lead or joint applicant submitting the project. So this criteria, or this criterion is where the, that limitation I mentioned early on about how the partnership program is confined to certain Amtrak or other publicly owned or controlled railroad assets, this is where that provision is established. It's through the Qualified Railroad Asset uh, definition. 
Second, you need assets that are contained in the appropriate planning documents and cost allocation policies. And this part of the Qualified Railroad Asset Definition is where Northeast Corridor projects and non-Northeast Corridor projects have uh, different requirements, which I'll cover in the next two slides. Finally, your assets need to not be in a state of repair, as I mentioned earlier. So when you reference that state of repair definition given above, or you look in the note before it, you should understand that the project you're putting forward is going to be short of being in a state of good repair at this point. So project eligibility, if you're considering a non-Northeast Corridor project, so anywhere else in the United States except for the geography, uh, the rail lines, that make up the Northeast Corridor in, in this uh, program. Here's how that definition works. So the first requirement is that you have ownership control by the lead or joint applicants. And how you demonstrate this is relatively straightforward. You could be the direct owner, or you can show that you have control over the assets you'd improve by the project, for example, through various agreements with the asset owners. And the purpose of those agreements would be to show and ensure that the project benefits and outcomes you're proposing would be achieved. The second part is being contained in the appropriate planning document. So on the, in the non-NEC context, you should show that your project is contained in the relevant state rail plan. So if you have a project in the state of Illinois, it should be uh, contained in the state rail plan in Illinois. If you have a project that Span state borders or crosses a couple, we look to all the relevant state rail plans. If it's not in the state rail plan, then you should show either that there are one or more equivalent planning documents that do contain the project and show the previous planning has been achieved, or you can amend your state rail plan to include the project. And we did provide instructions in the NOFO um, in Section D for how, to, uh, how you could amend your state rail plan well, at the same time that you're submitting an application. The third item is a cost allocation policy requirement. So off the NEC, you need to show that you are part of the Passenger Rail Investment Improvement Act, or PREA, Section 209 cost methodology policy, which includes all of the Amtrak state-supported services and the, and the routes that operate as state-supported services. Or you could demonstrate, if, if you don't meet that, definite part of the definition, you can demonstrate that the project assets are, sim are subject to a similar cost allocation agreement specific to those assets, that facility, that rail line, um, that set of equipment. Finally, uh, state of repair. I already covered this, but we do describe for you, we give instructions about how you should describe the asset condition and performance. As of the time, FAST was pa the FAST Act, the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, was passed, which is when this program was created, and indicate how your assets are not meeting that state good repair definition I mentioned before. Now, the same walkthrough for Northeast Corridor projects. Ownership and control is the same. The requirement is exactly the same as it is elsewhere. So I'll move on to the two that differ. Being contained in a planning document, if you have a NEC project, you need to show that that project is in the Northeast Corridor Commission's five-year capital investment plan, and that would be the most recent or current, the most current or most recently approved version of that document. If your proposed project is not in that capital investment plan, you can either show that your project is contained in an equivalent planning document, or um, working with the commission, you could update the capital investment plan to include the project. Third, in the Northeast Corridor, the relevant cost allocation policy is the PREA Section 212, um, Northeast Corridor Commuter and Intercity Rail Cost Allocation Policy. And I will say, by definition, that policy covers that same geographic territory I mentioned above when I was defining the Northeast Corridor in the context of the federal state partnership program. And finally, state of good repair, same exact condition as the non-NEC situation. So you do the same thing here. Um, describe the asset condition performance and tell us how you don't meet that definition. So that wraps product eligibility. Moving on to evaluation selection criteria. So how will FRA actually look at and evaluate the application that, that you would submit? 
evaluation criteria is in two categories, technical merit and project benefit. You should respond to all the factors as best as you can in your application in order to be most competitive for award. I've not listed every factor here, so I would refer you to Section E, Application Review Information, in the NOFO for the full criteria. But you can see that we are looking for project readiness, we're looking for um, information about the qualifications of key personnel and consistency with planning documents. On the benefit side, effects on system performance and safety, improved motor, mobile integration, and factors such as that. Similarly, there are numerous selection criteria that FRA will take into account when making selections. I've mentioned most of these preferences already. Um, the only one I think I haven't mentioned is that there's also a preference for applications where Amtrak is not a sole applicant. Um, and then I did mention about joint applications and 50% um, or greater non-federal match. And then we also have the, uh, it, it, the department will also consider our key departmental priorities, and you see those listed here. Again, I would refer you to the NOFA for the full list of these criteria. Finally, I'll wrap up with just a few other requirements and restrictions to be aware of. I've mentioned that we're not funding preliminary engineering uh, or NEPA or environmental clearances under this NOFO. The second one is consistent with our standard federal grant making procedures. There are certain costs incurred prior to selection or other kind of pre-award costs that would not be allowable and wouldn't be able to be used as match funds either. Third, um, we are prohibited under the authorization from doing sole benefit commuter rail passenger transportation projects. However, EPRA does recognize that many potential partnership program projects may be located in shared corridors where commuter and inner city passenger rail operate. And in these cases, we're noting that our primary intent is to fund reasonable investments in inner city passenger rail while recognizing that other benefits to other modes may be achieved. You should include and describe all your project benefits in your submission, but be sure to call out the inner city passenger rail benefits specifically and describe and justify your project as a reasonable uh, investment in inner city passenger rail if it's a project that has benefits to multiple modes of travel. Lastly, if you're a Northeast Corridor project, you do have a, a requirement to be in and maintain compliance with that Northeast Corridor cost allocation policy um, at the time of selection and also through, dura through the duration of the project if you were selected for an award. Now I'll hand the presentation off to Amy Hauser to discuss the NOFO and how to apply. Uh, thank you, Brian. So this section, again, I noticed um, several of you have participated in webinars before. You've probably applied for grants um, through FRA. So um, this is kind of a refresher for those who are who are experts at this, as well as um, you know, information for the new folks listening in. So to find information about our grant programs, um, be sure to check out the FRA Competitive Discretionary Grant Program webpage and the links at the top of the slide. Um, on that page, you'll find links to some summary information about our grant programs. In particular, you'll see here on this slide the partnership program. You can see a link right to the NOFO that will announce the grant opportunity in the Federal Register. And then there will also on this page, uh, we will be posting the webinar recording link, so you'll be able to access that, um, I would say, probably within a few days or so of the, this webinar. Okay, so if, once you click on that link for the NOFO, um, it will take you to the Federal Register, um, which was for this program, the announcement was published on October 8th, as Brian mentioned, and do note the application due date is on December 9th. Um, also, you may note the CFDA number. You can use this number for future use, especially as you're looking to submit your application. So once you get into the NOFO, um, here's a list of all the different parts of the NOFO. Um, we do provide the eligibility information that Brian just went over. Um, also important over the next few slides, we're going to talk about your application and submission information as well as application review information. So um, 
it's real important that you look through the, that no code. Okay, now we have a polling question. So I'll turn it over to Mary. Okay. Sorry about that, I was on mute. Uh, our polling question is, do you have any experience using grants.gov? A, yes, extensive. B, yes, limited. C, no experience, and we'll give that a few seconds. Okay, looks like about 42% have yes limited, 45, uh, 44, excuse me, have no experience, and 14 have extensive experience. Okay, thank you, Mary. So, up is um, how do you find out information about how to apply? So, um, you will search for the grants on grants.gov, um, and this be sure to note that um, this is where we accept the applications. We accept only accept applications electronically through grants.gov. So um, please be sure that you take a look at this early and make sure that you can meet the requirements to do so. You will search for the partnership grant information. And you can use that CFDA number to go directly to the opportunity, or you can use the search functions. You can look at the FRA grants, and you'll see a couple other grant programs as well as this one. Um, so once you click on the opportunity number, then you will see a synopsis of the grant program. Um, the synopsis on grant.gov, this gives you a summary of the information about the opportunity. Um, you can also, this is where you will start your application in grants.gov. If you see that red apply button, that's, that's where you're going to go. Um, be sure before you do apply that you have your DUNS number and you're registered in SAM. So uh, that's extremely important. Um, Entities registering in SAM, you must submit a notarized letter that appoints your authorized entity administrator. Um, and this SAM registration sometimes can take um, two weeks or more. So be sure that you, um, you register early and you have everything ready to go for your application uh, so you're not waiting till the last minute to apply. So we're having A little bit of a um, freeze here on the slides. So I'll just keep on, on going here. Um, so um, as you prepare your application, be sure you focus on the required documents listed in the NOFO. Um, especially important is the project narrative and statement of work because those are the documents that our technical reviewers are going to be looking at as they're rating your applications. Um, other important information that, that reviewers are going to look at as well are your benefit cost analysis and your environmental documentation. So the forms, there are several forms that are required for uh, your application as you go to grants.gov. Um, your SF-424, that's your application for federal assistance. Um, you will either submit an SF-424A or C. Um, the A is the budget information for non-construction. In this case, it could be for a project such as acquiring equipment. Or the C form would obviously be for construction. If you have a project that is both for non-construction and construction purposes, fill out the construction forms. And then for the assurances for non-construction, um, that's your SF-424B, and your assurances for construction are your SF-424D. Also remember to fill out your um, SF-LLL, which is your disclosure for lobbying activities. Um, so as well as, I kind of skipped over, the FRA additional assurances and certifications. Right now that form is not electronically in grants.gov, so you can find that form um, as, you, as you look at the other information, um, and I'll go over that on the next slide. So um, 
that form again. We're working on getting that one um, in our electronic forms package on grants.gov. Um, but for this particular grant program, uh, note that you're going to have to download that form and complete it and then uh, attach it to um, your application. So this is where that form can be found. It's under um, the Related Documents tab when you So a lot of folks tend to forget that form, but um, it is important that, that you complete that one as well. If you have any questions about that, please give me a call. So next, Brian, he's going to, going to go over some additional best practices. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, start off the best practices section here, um, and I'll uh, go through the project narrative, um, best practices, but right off the start, um, I will say that the best overall advice is to read the NOFO carefully, then read it again carefully, and then also one more time. Uh, I will say FRA try, we try very hard to put all of the necessary information um, that you need to be able to, to submit a successful application in the NOFO. Um, so I do urge you to just follow that very carefully and follow those instructions. Now, when applications do fall short, uh, it is usually one of the three areas we've noted here, and these are the three, the narrative, statement of work, and benefit cost analysis that we'll provide some additional guidance on today. So I'll start with project narrative. Uh, the narrative is a core element of your application. It's usually the primary document that FRA is going to review to understand your overall project proposal. You really should spend the effort to make the narrative as clear and comprehensive as possible. I also uh, will remind you to keep, there, tell you to keep in mind that FRA's reviewers uh, will include a range of subject matter experts who may or may not have familiarity with the particulars of your proposed project or region of the country or other, or other product-specific details. So in writing up your narrative, um, be careful to limit jargon or at least explain terms that are specific to the project um, and that might be kind of those project-specific terms of art uh, to give us enough context so we make sure we understand what you're talking about. And you see here on the left side of the screen the project narrative outline. We recommend that you structure your project narrative directly using this outline. If you follow this exact format, these sections, it's very helpful to us in review to actually have that information um, right in the order in which it's requested. You should include everything in this outline and follow the instructions within elements. For example, there are multiple criteria that I discussed before to satisfy for project eligibility, and you should make sure to be responsive to each element. Don't ignore those sub-elements. And I recognize it can be a tight page limit, the 25-page uh, limit, and I will say that one way to stay within and adhere to that limit is to not feel compelled to include other things that we aren't asking for in this outline. Um, so if it's not relevant here, we do not need that to be able to make our um, assessment and judgment on your application. Okay, uh, so on the cover page, um, nothing fancy here, follow the instructions, include what the NOFO calls for in the title page. In the federal state, program that does include indicating if you have a joint or solo application. And if a joint application, please include all of the parties that are the joint applicants right there on the cover page. Then the project summary. This, I would think of the project summary as basically the first paragraph or two of a news story. It gives us a succinct statement of the what, where, and why of the project. You know, what is this project doing? Why should we care? What are the highlights of the anticipated um, outcomes of the project. You really can think of it as your elevator pitch in kind of the short, pithy way that, that we'll know what this project is about. In project funding, just make sure to emphasize that your actual funding request is clear. Uh, tell us how much money you are requesting for the partnership program and, and what that award amount would be if selected. And then also identify all the funding sources, including at all, any and all non-federal sources you're planning to, to uh, use to carry out the project. You could reference here letters of support or joint application sign-on statements from those funding partners if that's applicable. You also should note any restrictions or limitations on the use of the non-federal match that you're providing. Maybe the non-federal funds 
uh, need to be spent by a certain date or are only provided toward a certain part of the project, like a particular element, please identify that if so. And if you include in-kind match, uh, indicate the type of that in-kind match and describe the amounts, like how they were valued and uh, how you arrived at the value of the in-kind match. The next thing I'll talk through is detailed project description. You'll notice I skipped applicant and project eligibility since I covered that in detail back in the first part of the presentation. And the detailed project description is where you take that project summary and you expand it. Give us the full picture here of the what, where, why, et cetera. What is this project doing? What challenges or transportation issues are you trying to solve? What are your expected outcome and benefits? Why is this particular project needed to deliver those benefits? How is it going to do that? These are the types of questions you want to answer here in the project description. You also, this is your opportunity also to give a little bit more context if needed. Um, you know, who owns or is the host railroad in this, for these assets or facilities? What operate, rail operators are here? Is there some limited history that is relevant, necessary to explain the reason or project background? I also recommend including photos with captions to explain what they're showing, or diagrams if those, are, if, if those help explain what's happening in the project. You can also include quantifiable information. Um, you know, tell us something about this, the rail line or facility. Is it busy? How much use does it get? Annual daily or daily ridership figures, number of trade moves. That type of information can color your project description to give us a good sense of the overall landscape. Project location is very straightforward. Um, identify where this project is. Give us the names of cities, counties, states where it's located. Include a map or two of the project. Um, oftentimes, good applications will have a close-in uh, immediate area map and more of an overview map showing a broader context of how it fits into a metropolitan region or a state. If you have a project that involves grade crossings, um, give us the US, include in the application the USDOT highway rail grade crossing inventory number so that we know precisely which crosses you are discussing. On evaluation selection criteria, you should include in your narrative a discrete section that specifically takes your project and, and tells us how you view the project as meeting the evaluation selection criteria. And as, I, as you may remember from up above, um, there's a number of these. So in the NOFO we just issued, we have seven technical merit criteria uh, and four project benefit criteria plus the selection criteria. You don't need a dissertation on each one, but you should make some reference to how um, you're responsive to all of those criteria. Do it here also, and aside from including it in your benefit cost analysis, in fact, a good practice would be to repeat and elevate key findings from your technical analysis into this section. Don't just leave them in the benefit cost submission or somewhere else in your application. On project implementation and management, uh, there's sort of two parts to hit here. The first part is to discuss past performance. So mention similar projects that you've carried out or your joint applicants have carried out um, or other project partners have carried out. Uh, have you done grants with FRA before? Have you done grants with other federal entities? Give us a brief history of the experience of your organization in carrying out similar types of work. And the second part is describe how you're planning to approach the proposed project. Um, are you planning to contract it out? What sort of methods? Are you doing a design build of a project together or separately? Are you hiring external, um, uh, an external construction manager or project manager or doing that in-house in your, your own organization's project management functions? Um, just give us some sense of if we select this project, how we would, how you would plan to implement it. Um, we realize you may not know the answer to all that right now, but we just want to get your best sense at the time of your submission. And then on environmental readiness, um, the goal here is to tell us where you are in the environmental process for this project. Just be as straightforward as you can about status. We don't need a, a lot. We just need to clearly understand your situation. Uh, so is your NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, are your clearances complete? Are they underway? Are they not started? If they're complete, when did you receive the decision? If underway, what type of review is occurring? Is it a categorical exclusion, an environmental assessment, an environmental impact statement? 
Um, if you're underway, do you know when a decision is anticipated? If you haven't started, how long do you believe the process would be to go through the environmental clearances, and what type of review are you anticipating? I will say that uh, in partnership, we know a number of projects, with given the state of good repair and existing asset type of nature of the project, we recognize that many of them might fit as a categorical exclusion. And if so, you can go ahead and fill out a categorical exclusion worksheet and attach it with your application um, as part of your application submission. Now I'm going to hand it back over to Amy to talk through best practices on statement of work. Hey, thank you, Brian. Okay, now I'm just going to go over a few tips. Um, you can find the templates uh, for your statement of work, or we usually include that as your scope, schedule, and budget. Um, those templates are on our website. They're your statement of work, which is attachment two, your schedule, which is attachment three, and your budget, which is attachment four. So in the past, folks were used to just one attachment that includes all three of those items. Um, but now we do have those three separate templates, so do remember to complete each one of those. Um, if you're curious, attachment one, that's the grants, terms, and conditions, of which you can see an example on the website as well. So here's some statement of work tips. Um, do make sure that your tasks are in a logical order um, and they're associated with your um, elements of your budget as well as your schedule. Um, do you think about what deliverables you need to, that you need to communicate to us um, and give us the status if, if some of them, um, you know, when you expect those to be completed? Um, this will be your draft statement of work. Uh, so um, we look at this primarily to look at readiness. Um, but do know that if you are selected for a grant, then you will be revising the statement of work and working with a team of folks. But do the best you can on this so we know um, where you're at with the project, uh, as well as um, you know how complete it would be. Um, another note after after reading the statement of work, it's sometimes helpful if you have someone who um, might be a novice. So they really understand what the project is and what the key tasks will be, how much it will cost, and how long it should take. Um, state, again, as I said, these statements of work are typically updated following the selection, but do provide the best information that you can so that um, it's easier for us to work with you during the post-selection part of the project. Okay. It's, if you need some extra help with cost estimating, we do have a guide here for capital cost estimating. I provided the link on this slide. Um, and this helps with consistency. So do take a look at that as you're completing the information for your um, statement of work and budget. Okay, so now we're going to move into the cost benefit analysis practices. And I'm gonna turn this over to Mary for a polling question. All right, thank you. Our polling question is, do you have experience preparing a cost-benefit analysis? A, yes, extensive. B, yes, limited. Or C, no experience. It looks like we have about 19% have experience extensive experience, about 42 limited, and 38 no experience. Um, <clears throat> that's good to know. Uh, in the past, we've, we've maybe had more people who had more experience, so that's good to be aware of that. Um, I will try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, the first reason is why do we have cost-benefit analysis. Um, it is part of the statutory requirement for this uh, program. There are similar uh, requirements in TIGER, BUILD, uh, INFRA, and CRISI. So it is something that Congress has required us to do. Uh, it, it actually forces you to make sure that your project scope and your project outcomes uh, match up and that the benefits from the proposed project uh, are reasonable. And finally, it actually, uh, it, 
a lot of the projects that we get are very different in size and magnitude, and it's very difficult for us to make comparisons across those uh, different categories without a benefit cost analysis. So that is the fairest way for us to compare the different projects. So just as a brief overview of the steps, um, you first need to identify your base case, your alternate case, and your timeline. And I will say that uh, it's extremely important on, on this point to read the USDOT benefit cost guidance document. Uh, we will have a link to that in this presentation. Um, and follow the specific uh, guidance that they give on all three of those. Secondly, you need to show how the alternate case, i.e. The, the proposed project that you are uh, presenting in your application will lead to the project benefits. Um, and then third, you need to take those benefits, the overarching benefits, and break them down into uh, the smallest pieces that you can so that they can be uh, monetized. Um, because what we are looking for as the end result of a BZA is a dollar figure. Uh, it should be a positive dollar figure, but that, that uh, by breaking it down into the smallest elements, you can uh, more easily apply the BZA guidance. And then finally, uh, calculate your, your results and then discount them to the base year uh, I believe off the top of my head, we are still using, working with $2,017. Um, presumably, uh, the Secretary's Office will release um, 2018 figures at some point. But until then, continue to use the most recent guidance, which is the December of 2018 um, version. So the base case uh, needs to reflect the status quo of how the world currently exists. Uh, we are not interested in um, uh, proposed projects of that uh, or proposed alternatives that are not going to be um, undertaken. And the alternative case needs to be specifically the project that you are proposing in your statement of work. Uh, we are not interested in additional pieces uh, if, if the benefits of this project cannot be accomplished with the proposed project, that needs to reflect that reality in your benefit cost analysis. Finally, the timeline is, oh, sorry. Um, as a point on that alternate case, a lot of times you will have projects that have, um, could be done independently. Let's say you have a series of grade crossings, a uh, corridor of grade crossings that you'd like to um, either separate or close, you need to conduct an analysis on each one of those uh, grade crossings separately rather than the entire project as a whole. Uh, it's often the case that um, only a project won't be only partially funded. And by undertaking this, uh, we can make sure that we are uh, appropriately evaluating the individual elements of your project. Uh, the time project that should reflect the useful life of the assets that you are buying or constructing um, and it should not be longer than 30 years of operation um, anything longer than 30 years you would need to uh, reflect the re residual value of those assets using standard accounting uh, practices So the only thing that we are concerned about in the benefit cost analysis is the difference between the base case and the alternate case. Uh, we are not concerned about differences between um, different alternate cases. Uh, everyone can always find a more expensive and less efficient way to do a project um, that's irrelevant. The, the only thing that we are interested in is how the specific alternative case will affect the world as it exists today. That, that's extremely important to focus in on that. That's where a lot of BCAs fall apart. Um, those differences should reflect realistic projections. Uh, things are not going to suddenly double overnight. Your, your growth rate will not suddenly double overnight just because you wish it. 
uh, unless there's some significant structural change, uh, we would expect past performance to be indicative of future performance. Um, and here are just a few examples of uh, different assumptions that are, we, we a lot of times see assumptions that don't reflect the way that railroads actually operate in the real world. So try to be as realistic as possible uh, when you can. So as I said, the marginal effects of the alternate case that it brings about are the project benefits. Um, there will be times when those marginal effects are negative. Uh, if the project increases congestion or you know, on a highway, for example, um, it's rare, but it does happen, and those are shown as negative dollar amounts and are netted against the total positive project benefits. Uh, the total cost of the project should be just the cost of implement of bringing the the service uh, or, or the project itself to completion. Um, any additional operations and maintenance costs uh, need to be included, but they should be net maintenance costs and they should be included as benefits. So in the case of um, if you're buying, like, for example, brand new rolling stock, uh, that rolling stock will have operations and maintenance costs uh, that will be positive, which means they will be negative benefits. I know that it can be a little confusing. There is a section in the BCA guidance uh, about that. Um, however, if you're replacing rolling stock and you're replacing it with uh, more efficient rolling stock or, or rolling stock that will need less maintenance, you could have a net negative uh, O&M cost, which would then be a project benefit. So please just follow the guidance on that section in the BCA guidance. Um, and again, residual value is a benefit. Uh, do not subtract it from the project cost. Project cost should be only the dollar amounts that are paid to uh, actually construct or, or purchase the project. So after you've actually uh, figured out what the kind of major categories of marginal effects will be, you need to break them down into small chunks that will be, uh, you'll be able to tackle in order to monetize those effects. So that's where the bulk of your actual work is going to be done in the BCA. Uh, it is important that in this section, uh, in, in this portion of the BCA that you are documenting your assumptions your personal data with as much accuracy and clarity as you possibly can, and then providing us that documentation. So just as an example, um, repairing a bridge uh, is going to have many different effects, but you could broadly say that it will probably improve trip times, um, and it might, you know, save uh, harmful emissions. So here's three different ways that it would actually affect your trip times that are different and are going to be calculated in different manners. So we would want to see you break those things out uh, in order to, you know, increase our confidence that your um, analysis is correct. Uh, it's very important for intercity passenger rail. Uh, a lot of um, project benefits that are achieved through uh, these types of projects are from diverting passengers from other uh, sources, I mean, other modes of transportation. Um, so we are only concerned with the marginal effects of a modal diver a diversion. Um, it's important that you follow the uh, rules in the guidance. There's a section on that. Um, and it is important that uh, in the case of maintaining service, Losing ridership to cars or to another form like airplanes, uh, that revenue that the intercity passenger rail provider would lose is not a benefit. Um, that money is saved by those passengers who then must use it to either uh, use some other form of transportation or not go on the trip. So they're actually losing out. It's, it's important that that lost revenue is not considered 
uh, a benefit for the purposes of uh, the BCA. Um, and just as a few examples, uh, there, are, there are many different uh, ways that diverting people to rail uh, is especially helpful for relieving uh, congestion on highways and um, relieving environmental pressure from harmful emissions. So uh, those are just a couple of the ways that you could quantify that rather than just lost revenue. So as a, a quick wrap up, document your assumptions in as much detail as possible, provide citations, provide sources. Uh, if you have your own data, please provide specifically what years and, and all of that stuff. If your application contains multiple projects that can be separated, please analyze the benefits and costs of each of those uh, projects separately. Uh, if it is including modal diversion, uh, it's especially important to give us uh, passenger counts, um, especially in situations where those are not um, available as if uh, like a, for um, certain aspects of, of commuter rail that might be affected. Um, for the most part, we, we do have Amtrak ridership numbers. Um, and then finally, uh, the AADT, the average daily traffic at grade crossing projects, uh, state DOTs very frequently fail to update those information. So if you're relying uh, on um, daily traffic, please provide us that information uh, rather than simply relying on what is in the, um, the Federal Highway database. And then lastly, you need to provide all of this information in an Excel spreadsheet that clearly shows all of your calculations. Uh, if we have to go hunting to see your work and how your calculations are achieved, um, that's not going to make us very confident that you are uh, being transparent in the uh, analysis. And just as, oh, so we do have, um, we, can, we can add it in. Uh, when this is posted, but the link to the BCA guidance uh, itself. All right. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Nate. So just a few recaps and um, recap information and reminders. Um, as Brian said, make sure you read that NOFO. A lot of times I do ask, answer questions about what do I need to include in my application, and um, we go through that checklist. It's, it's very important that you have that in front of you while you're uh, filling out your application. So, um, and then after you read that NOFO, determine what a successful project will look like. Um, again, use that checklist, um, address all the evaluation and selection criteria, um, and be very clear and direct in responding to that criteria. Um, again, don't or vary your complete, um, your um, points. Um, next, uh, make sure that you verify all budget figures match corresponding figures cited in different parts of your application package. This happens quite frequently. Make sure everything is consistent. Um, be sure to check those numbers that are on your cover sheet, your statement of work, your project narrative, and the other various forms, and make sure that they all match up. Make sure that the numbers in your columns and rows add up properly in your budget tables. Um, and be sure to only include those project costs that are expected to be incurred after the grant selection. So if, it's, if this project is part of a larger component, um, just make sure that your um, information focuses on those project costs um, that FRA is going to be reimbursing as well as what will be part of your match. Um, name those key partners, indicate those in place agreements, include your letters of support. Um, again, it helps to have a cold reader that um, is unfamiliar with your grant application to review it and make sure everything um, makes sense before you submit it. Now, a little bit about the, the process. Um, once we receive the applications, um, we do review them first, uh, what we call a process called intake, where we look at completeness, making sure that you've completed the proper forms and also requirements that are in the NOFO. We also spend quite a bit of time, especially with this one, looking at eligibility. 
So make sure that you follow those requirements that Brian went through. And then we pass those um, eligible applications over to a panel of technical experts that do that evaluation that we talked about, as well as the environmental protection specialists look at your environmental readiness, and the economists look at your benefit cost analyses. Then all of that information is sent over to um, senior officials who look at that and make the final um, decisions for funding. Um, and then within about approximately four to five months following the application due date, um, FRA will announce a press release that, um, that announces those selected projects. We also send out emails to those um, applicants that were not selected for um, projects. So a little bit about the timeframes. Um, we've received a lot of questions regarding the timing of grants once projects are selected. So this information may be helpful for you regarding the timing of your project. Um, once a project is selected, it goes through a pre-obligation stage where you'll be refining your statement of work, your scope, schedule, and budget. You'll be working with a, a team, with a regional manager, grant managers, and other subject matter experts. You'll be refining those performance measures, as well as um, making sure that everyone understands and um, reviews and is able to sign the grant agreement. Um, as well as those NEPA requirements, especially for this grant, they need to be um, completed so that you're ready for um, the final design and construction phase of your project. Um, from there, once your grant agreement is signed, you'll be working again with your team, um, your regional team, and um, you'll be working on your project as well as completing quarterly progress and financial forms, um, as well as submitting your invoices to us, as well as your deliverables, and those will also be reviewed by that team. Also, you'll go through a monitoring process, um, and that could be routine monitoring as well annual monitoring reviews and site visits. So that all happens during the post-obligation phase, which typically takes about two to four years. Um, once your project is completed, you'll go through a closeout period where you'll, where you'll be submitting your financial, um, final financial information, reconciling that information, and completing fin your final performance report. And that takes about one to three months following the um, end of your period of performance. So keep, keep all of that in mind. If you have any questions about that, you can feel free to give us a call. So right now, this ends the presentation portion of our webinar. So we put up the uh, last slide here that gives our contact information. So in general, if you have questions about eligibility or the overall program, um, and design or just questions about, you know, could this be eligible, might this make sense, you can reach out to me. Uh, it's Brian Rada. My email's there. Um, and then if you have a benefit cost analysis related question, you can reach out to our industry economist, Nate Vomisel, who went through that section for you. And uh, Amy's our specialist when it comes to all of the grant procedures, match funding related questions, submission questions, um, like making sure you have the right procedures for submitting through grants.gov and, and documents and forms. Um, so we're happy to have you reach out to any of the, if the, of the three of us. And then uh, at the very bottom, we also just have the, uh, the main page, the main landing page for our competitive discretionary grant program website. And during the solicitation period here, now through early December, you'll find the Fed State Partnership information right up at the top of the page under the currently accepting applications uh, part of the site. Thank you all for joining us today for the fiscal year 2019 Federal State Partnership for State of Good Repair Grant Program Webinar.